Beware the unknown. Fear the beast and leave these woods if you can. Over the Garden Wall is one of my favorite pieces of animation of all time. A gothic, folksy, nightmarish fairy tale filled with bubbly, expressive characters, immaculate backgrounds, and a perfectly paced, well-rounded story. But beyond its surface-level beauty, the miniseries also has an incredible character journey for its main character, Wirt, that ties perfectly into the show's themes. And that character journey and these themes are perfectly framed by the name of the story's location, the unknown. Wirt is a character who completely embodies the phrase, fear the unknown. For most of the story, the majority of his motivations and actions, or inactions, are fueled by that fear. A fear that the things he doesn't understand or can't control will inevitably lead to catastrophe. He looks at nearly any scenario and firmly sets his mind on the worst possible outcome. And this is why he fears the unknown. Why Wirt is so often paralyzed by that fear. The antithesis to Wirt is, of course, his half-brother, Greg. Greg is much younger, meaning ignorance could be the source of his lack of fear. But regardless, Greg leaps into nearly every situation, no matter how frightening it may appear, fearlessly and with an optimistic expectation that everything will turn out alright. And the juxtaposition of these brothers' mindsets are illustrated beautifully and immediately in Over the Garden Wall. In Chapter 1, The Old Grist Mill, the story begins with Wirt and Greg walking through the woods. As Wirt slowly realizes that they may be lost, he begins to panic, while Greg calmly gives simple, non-panicked answers. Where are we? In the woods? I mean... What are we doing out here? We're walking home. Wirt immediately assumes the worst, while Greg seems to have no concerns whatsoever. And they continue to illustrate these differences as soon as they hear the woodsmen chopping trees in the distance. Do you think it's some kind of deranged lunatic with an axe waiting out there in the darkness for innocent victims? Right. Greg! Their different attitudes could not be made more clear here. Wirt assumes the stranger might be a murderer waiting to kill them, and Greg just immediately runs towards the axe chopping sounds. Greg tends to spin things positively no matter what. Later in the episode, when he encounters the giant black dog, it's a clear situation where fear should take over. But instead, Greg compliments the monster. Wirt is, of course, terrified of the giant beastly dog, while Greg uselessly spanks it with the handle of the woodsman's axe. Even as they're being chased by this dangerous monster, Greg's optimistic outlook shines through. Greg! This is amazing, huh? And these attitudes are clear for the majority of the series. In Chapter 2, Hard Times at the Huskin Bee, Wirt and Greg are looking for a nearby town at the woodsman's suggestion. We're then properly introduced to Beatrice, a talking bluebird, who wants to take Wirt and Greg to Adelaide, the good lady of the woods, to help them get home. While Greg is pretty open to talking with Beatrice and hearing her suggestions, Wirt has no interest in the things that he doesn't understand. No, 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 no. Magic talking birds leading us to fairy godmothers in the mysterious... I'm going to Pottsfield. There's nothing about Beatrice's plan that is familiar to Wirt, and so he fears and rejects it. But a town where he can ask for help is something he fully comprehends. And it isn't until they actually spend some time in Pottsfield that Wirt realizes this isn't your usual town. When they stumble upon the Harvest Festival, Wirt thinks that these are regular people wearing pumpkin costumes. But once he realizes there's something more supernatural going on, when Enoch reveals himself, Wirt wants to leave. Chapter 3, School Town Follies opens with Greg singing a song he wrote about going to Adelaide's house called The Adelaide Parade, and the lyrics once again showcase Greg's lack of fear of the things he doesn't know. Don't know who she is or how she is or when or why she is, but as for where she is, she is where we will go. Even explicitly saying he knows absolutely nothing about Adelaide, Greg excitedly sings about going to see her. Wirt, as you might expect, does not sing along or share in that excitement. In Chapter 4, Songs of the Dark Lantern, we actually get a clear example of Wirt it's inaction driven by his fear of two separate unknown things that are at odds with one another. But it's creepy. Why don't you guys go ask for directions and I'll just wait out? No, wait, I, I don't want to be out here by myself. In Chapter 
5's mad love, Greg is the one pressing Quincy Endicott to hunt for the ghost he saw in his mansion. And not only does Greg not have any fear of the concept of ghosts, his desire to see something so mysterious and unknown is actually the thing driving him. He's sure they'll find the ghost. How could you be so certain? Because I really, really want to see a ghost. But I think the most important aspect of Wirt's fears is that they don't only drive his actions when dealing with this spooky, supernatural, creepy woodland that is the unknown. Wirt's fears also dictate all of his actions and inactions in relation to his life back in the real world. In Mad Love, Wirt and Beatrice open up to each other, and it takes so much convincing from Beatrice for Wirt to admit his quote-unquote dark secrets that he claims are too secret. It's weird to admit it, but, well, I I have this crush on this girl. Mm -hmm. That's all. Wirt struggles to even admit to a stranger that he has a crush on a girl. The thought of that information being public to any degree absolutely terrifies him. The unknown results of putting himself out there, the expectation that it will go wrong, that he'll be embarrassed or rejected, and the penultimate episode of the series, aptly titled Into the Unknown, is the perfect illustration of Wirt's fears dictating his behavior. As the episode opens, we see Wirt is inspired to actually put himself out there. He makes a Halloween costume and grabs a cassette tape he made for his crush, Sarah, and then he heads off into the night. But as you might expect, he gets cold feet. I, I want to. I can't. Greg, of course, has no fears in grabbing the tape and trying to give it to Sarah for Wirt. But even with Greg's help putting himself out there, Wirt continues to backpedal, fearing the embarrassment when she hears what's on the tape. And his fears and anxieties are so clear in his attempts to reclaim the tape. They go to a party that he wasn't invited to, so he stresses about going in. But Greg just runs right on in fearlessly and is welcomed with open arms. Wirt just assumes that Greg is embarrassing him, but he's actually met with kind welcomes. Oh, hey, guys. I don't know what he said, but it, it wasn't true. Oh, hey, Wirt. How's it going? Yeah, Even when it could not be clearer that Wirt's specific fears and anxieties aren't founded, he continues to set his mind on those worst possible outcomes. Everyone at the party is happy to see him. Sarah even specifically says she was asking about Wirt and invites him to the graveyard with some friends to hang out. But Wirt refuses to see these obvious green lights and instead wallows in his fears. And this attitude we see from Wirt before he enters the unknown completely informs his journey and growth over the course of the miniseries. Because the unknown is a mysterious place filled with countless unfamiliar things, places, scenarios, people, and the most important thing about these mysteries is that they are almost never what they seem. Is the dove never to meet the sea for want of the odious mountain? One of the most fundamental aspects of Over the Garden Wall is that things, no matter how mysterious or spooky, might not always be what they seem. As the series showcases Wirt and Greg entering into the unknown, it's also asking us as an audience to embrace what we don't fully understand. The entire opening sequence of the series illustrates this, with the soothing yet haunting frog playing piano, and a series of ominous and unexplained scenes. Watching the series for the first time, None of these scenarios make any sense. It's mysterious and unknown imagery that some might draw conclusions about, but over the course of the series, all of these images are properly explained. Which perfectly frames Wirt's journey of self-discovery. Nearly every episode of the show, we are presented with an unknown, frightening character, scenario, concept, etc. And every time, we are shown that the darkest conclusions we may have drawn about those things are incorrect. In the Old Grist Mill, Wirt expects that the woodsman is a deranged killer, but he's actually a kind old man with his own burdens to bear. Despite some misconceptions that peak in valley over the series, ultimately, the woodsman is a good man trying to help. Later in the episode, the kids have to escape the monstrous black dog, and as it turns out, this was just a kind, regular pup who ate this black turtle that corrupted him. In Hard Times at the Huskin Bee, Enoch appears to be a terrifying supernatural creature ready to punish Wirt, Greg, and Beatrice for trespassing, but when he sentences them, we get this incredible soothing needle drop transition. I sentence you to a few hours of manual labor. Wait, what? Really? That's it? Later, it appears as though they've been digging their own graves as they discover skeletons in the holes. 
But as it turns out, these were just some more folks being brought back for the harvest. All of the pumpkin people were skeletons, and they're harvesting some of their friends to join them. In School Town Follies, Mr. Langtree, who runs the school, appears to be an angry, hard-nosed businessman who doesn't allow any fun. But as it turns out, he's just a sad, penniless man who's worried that his school might need to be shut down. If only something would go right for a change. The giant gorilla on the loose turns out to be Miss Langtree's lost lover, Jimmy Brown, who took a job at the circus to buy her a wedding ring. But when I got stuck in the dang suit, everybody was too doggone scared to help me out. In Songs of the Dark Lantern, the tavern looks incredibly creepy, but outside of the highwayman, everyone there was incredibly kind and embraced Wirt in his journey. In Mad Love, the ghost that Quincy Endicott saw turned out to not be a ghost at all, with the reveal that his mansion was so huge that it actually connected to the mansion of Marguerite Gray, the owner of a Rival tea company. You mean that beautiful ghost was really just... That dashing specter was really just my, my business, business competitor? competitor? In Lullaby in Frogland, we discover that Greg's frog actually has a beautiful singing voice, revealing that the frog in the intro of the show is actually this very frog, regaling us with beautiful medleys. And over the garden wall Throughout the show, Wirt continually refers to Jason Funderburker and frames him as this perfect dude who he couldn't possibly compete with. He calls him the total package, but when we actually finally meet him... Hey, Sarah. Are you ready to go? Hey, Jason Funderburker. In Ringing of the Bell, Auntie Whispers seems like an obviously evil old woman who's turned Lorna into a servant, but as it turns out, she is actually a kind old woman, helping prevent Lorna's curse from afflicting others. But this leads well into an important point the show makes. Other things in this show appear to be good or safe and turn out to be dangerous. Lorna herself is a lovely girl who Wirt trusts, but it turns out she is afflicted by a curse that turns her into a people-eating demon. Beatrice's initial plan was actually to lure Wirt and Greg to Adelaide to exchange them for her family's freedom from their bluebird transformations. Adelaide herself turned out to be a wicked witch that demanded child servants. And I think this is why the show's balance between Wirt's fear of everything he doesn't know and Greg's completely fearless leaps into the things he doesn't know is so important. They each needed to learn a little bit from each other. Wirt needed to learn to shed the fear that paralyzes him from trying new things, and Greg needed to learn to be more discerning and observant before he dives into something headfirst. And their journeys aren't linear as they grow, regress, and overcome their shortcomings over the course of these 10 episodes. Yes. Into the unknown. Through his journey in the unknown, Wirt's real-life fears and anxieties are pretty directly addressed through these mysterious scenarios he finds himself in. As they see that things that seem frightening or scary might not actually be that, we see significant progress in Wirt. How he starts to embrace things that he fears or doesn't understand. He opens up more. He puts himself out there. He takes risks. In Songs of the Dark Lantern, after the tavern folks hype up Wirt and label him the Pilgrim, Wirt leaps into action to help Beatrice. He jumps onto a horse, grabs a lantern, and rides into the forest to fearlessly save his friend. In Mad Love, Wirt actually starts to open up to Beatrice. He learns more about Beatrice herself and how she's actually a human who threw a rock at a bluebird, cursing her entire family and turning them all into bluebirds. And he tells Beatrice his darkest secrets, even though those quote-unquote secrets are relatively mundane pieces of info about himself. But to Wirt, reveal Feeling that he has a crush on Sarah is the riskiest, scariest thing he faced back in his regular life. He learned to trust Beatrice and open up to her, and started to embrace the things that weren't perfectly clear to him. In Lullaby and Frogland, Beatrice manages to convince Wirt to play the bassoon with the band. Wirt is initially convinced of the worst. Wirt, you can do it. Seriously, nobody wants to hear me play. I do. And of course, Beatrice was right. The crowd loved his bassooning, and Wirt felt supported and affirmed. He was really starting to see and understand the value in putting yourself out there, opening up to people, and not letting your anxieties about the worst case scenario prevent you from acting. But there was, unfortunately, a major regression in this development. With the revelation that Beatrice had been leading Wirt and Greg to Adelaide not to help them get home, but only to trade them to save her own family, Wirt's worst fears are realized. But I, I thought we were friends. 
And this backslide into his old ways is a far one. Even though he saw how different his life can be if he opens up to others, if he puts himself out there, if he isn't scared to be himself, he has now been betrayed by the one person he started to put his faith in. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have trusted anyone. And after this, we see just how hopeless Wirt becomes. Each episode following, it gets worse and worse. He no longer has any faith that they'll be able to get out of the situation. I just don't know what I'm doing out here anymore. I don't know if we'll ever get back home. And as Wirt sinks deeper into self-loathing and hopelessness, he basically gives up. He gives up any hope that they'll find a way home, any faith that they'll make it through the woods, even while Greg is endlessly optimistic. Greg? Yes, Wirt? Can we please stop pretending we're gonna get home? Huh? Can we admit we're lost for good? But this fog is deeper than we can ever understand. And this hopelessness is exactly what the beast feeds on. How he turns lost souls into Adelwood trees. The lyrics to the song the beast sings, Come Wayward Souls, says this pretty explicitly. Sorrow and fear are easily forgotten when you submit to the soil of the earth. Rather than deal with the adversity he's facing, Wirt chooses to give up. Submitting to the unknown means he doesn't have to stress about his sadness or anxieties. But it's also selfish, because what Wirt isn't acknowledging is that he is also letting his brother down, despite Greg's endless optimism. This is foreshadowed in the first episode of the show by the woodsman. You are the elder child! You are responsible! for you and your brother's actions. When Wirt gives up, he isn't just dooming himself, he's dooming his brother. And when Wirt nonchalantly appoints Greg the new leader because he's given up, Greg takes this very seriously and personally. Greg's dream adventure in Cloud City showcases all of Greg's strengths and positivity. Even after the Old North Wind is let loose and the rest of the Cloud City residents run in fear, Greg faces off against him and actually succeeds. And due to his fearless success, he is granted a wish basically given an opportunity to go home. But because Wirt had given up and submitted to the unknown, he must stay behind. Greg, as the now leader, believes this is his fault. Oh, I should have been leading better. Greg's endless optimism both saves him and dooms him. He takes his brother's place and goes with the beast. His nature is so positive that he doesn't fear the beast at all, despite the fact that he maybe should. He saves Wirt at his own expense. Yes, come Gregory, there is much to be done. And then you'll show us the way home, right? Of course. After this, Wirt realizes his mistake. He was responsible for his brother, and he let his own hopelessness and inaction put him in danger. And this final scenario really highlights the purpose of these character journeys and how they relate to the themes. Wirt's submission to the unknown doomed him, and Greg's unending trust put him directly in the path of the beast. As I mentioned before, both Wirt and Greg needed to adopt parts of each other's attitudes. Wirt needed to be willing to put himself on the line and not fear the things he doesn't know. Because if he doesn't, he'll continue to be paralyzed by fear and inaction. Greg needed to be more careful with his optimistic attitude. Being so trusting and positive led to him trusting the wrong person. And in the end, they actually both sort of needed to learn the same thing. Both of them needed to exercise more discernment in how they view the things they don't understand. Wirt defaults to fear and worst case scenarios, which prevents him from making any progress. Greg defaults to endless optimism, which puts him in danger when people take advantage. They both need to know the unknown. Stop assuming the worst or best and instead observe and understand what it is they're experiencing. Wirt refused to do this so often in his real life. Even when we see Sarah basically telling Wirt that she is into him, inviting him to hang out with her, giving him the exact opening he needs, he fears that he will embarrass himself and he refuses. He didn't look at these scenarios with the proper discernment. But now with Greg in danger, Wirt faces the beast and he does exactly that. The beast initially offers Wirt a deal. As long as the flame stays lit, he will live on inside take on the task of lantern bearer or watch your brother perish. This appears as though it is the worst possible scenario, par for the course for what Wirt usually expects. But this time, 
Wirt doesn't submit to the unknown. Over the course of this journey, Wirt has learned that nothing in the unknown is exactly what it seems. There's always more going on underneath the surface. And so, he doesn't accept the situation at face value. And through his observations, he unveils the truth. You just have some weird obsession with keeping this lantern lit. It's almost like your soul is in this lantern. And to top off Wirt's newfound understanding of the unknown, he is faced with a direct question that embodies his fears. Are you ready to see true darkness? True darkness, where you can't see anything, the embodiment of the unknown. But Wirt sheds his fears. Are you? <gasps> don't! Don't! In the end, the scariest thing about the unknown is that it is unknown. The beast is this monstrous, scary, pitch black creature who feeds on lost souls, but his power resided in what people didn't know about him. And when Wirt made the effort to know the unknown, it turns out it wasn't so scary. They had the power over the beast all along. They just didn't know it. And we see Wirt take this lesson back to the real world with him immediately. After saving his brother and their frog, Wirt talks to Sarah and they plan a date. It took a journey through the unknown for Wirt to shed his fear of the unknown. And so the story is complete and everyone is satisfied with the ending and so on and so forth. And yet over the garden wall, Folks, I hope you enjoyed this exploration of both the themes of Over the Garden Wall and how they tie to Wirt's character journey. Two of my oldest videos on the channel are actually covering the inspirations that went into this show. You should check those out. Peace. The loveliest lies of